Welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with our guest, Adam Grimes from Waverly Advisors. Uh, before we get started, a quick disclosure. The Capital Discussions is not a broker-dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation, and I have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. And again, this is for educational purposes only. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and welcome you, Adam, back. It's, uh, it's the second or third time you've been with us, and it's always a pleasure. So Thank we're, you. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, and, just, I, and just while you're sharing your screen, just a quick plug. Uh, I've been uh, getting Adam's newsletter now for the better part of a year, and just, I have to say it's the best thing I've ever invested in newsletter-wise. So uh, kudos to you for that. It's just great. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, go Adam, ahead. Also, one of the things I just wanted to mention is that um, um, we ended up, we being Tom and I, spoke about uh, the pre-election stuff and mm -hmm. your call of a possible melt-up. Uh, was was unbelievably spot on. I mean, it really, really was good. The that that part of the analysis, I don't end up reading it like Tom does, but he shares a, a just a thoughts every once in a while, and that one was just amazing. Thank you. Well, it's you know the research, and first of all, Tom, but both of you, thank you for your kind words on the research. You know, it's been uh, it's been rewarding to me from a business perspective, but it's also been very gratifying from a personal perspective, which is really why I do this. Just hearing hearing the positive feedback, hearing the change that I've been able to make in people's work and trading. And you know, that's a that, that excites me and that keep that keeps me going. The um you know, and I think one of the things which it's actually relevant to today's presentation. By the way, can you see my screen? Is it correct? Do you see full yes, screen? Yes, we, we sure okay. can. Okay. And great. it's full screen. Fantastic. Thank you. Um <clears throat> you know one of the things that I think is a little bit different about my work is I try to approach it with, all, let's say, almost academic rigor, but also with a real awareness of down in the trenches price dynamics. And, you know, that's, that's not as common as we might wish, as, you know, of course, as you've seen. And I think that ties into what we're going to talk about today. So the presentation today is on volatility. Here's a high level perspective, what we're doing today. We're going to cover what is volatility, how do we measure it, what can go wrong with how we measure it and think about it, how we forecast it, and sprinkled throughout all of this are, is going to be a number of implications for traders, things you can do. Now, I know everybody I'm talking to today is an options trader, so you're all familiar with volatility, and I don't, I, I don't think today I'm going to give you anything really revolutionary. Rather, what I hope to do is give you some slightly new perspectives. And some of these new perspectives, you know, there, there may just be a couple nuggets to the presentation that you carry away and think about, but I'm going to share some things that have really made a difference in my understanding of volatility and in my trading, both from a directional and non-directional standpoint. And by the way, we'll do Q&A at the end, so if you have questions, jot them down so you don't forget by the time we get to the end. So uh, first of all, what is volatility? Well, the, this is a problem because we don't have a firm definition, and a lot of people, you know, we all talk about it, we all think we know what it is, but when you try to actually drill down to a bullet point, 100% correct definition, it gets to be a problem. And the way I think about volatility is that it's just a measure of uncertainty. The more volatile something is, the less certain I'm going to be where it is in the future. And of course, the problem is volatility changes. Something can be very not volatile today and very volatile a couple hours later. So this is a constantly ongoing, we have to recalibrate and rethink. Uh, one of the things that I would like you to rethink a little bit is this idea that volatility is a measure of risk. This is almost accepted doctrine in much of modern finance, and I'm not sure it's correct, and we'll look at, look at some reasons why not. By the way, one last thing before I really get started. You will probably notice I'm not the kind of presenter that reads every word on the slide to you, so I'll trust your literacy to read the slides, 
and I'll kind of talk around them a little bit. So how we measure volatility? Well, one of the well, one of the main ways is something we call historical volatility. And even this label is confusing. This confuses me sometimes because we can talk about future historical volatility, which is a little bit of a brain twister. Some people use statistical or realized volatility. And it's a measure where we first convert the price series to returns and then annualize the standard deviation of that. And it gives us, when we have historical volatility of 8 or 13%, that gives us the one standard deviation variation we expect over the year. And I know a lot of you probably use tools like this and measures like this to calculate your risk in trades. And here, you know, we'll, we'll look at this measure again at the bottom. This is a 20-day historical volatility plotted under the euro. And of course, we can do these calculations on any asset class, any time frame. The annualization factor needs to be different depending on the time frame, but the concept definitely carries through. So we use this and you know, people will project probabilities of option strikes being touched or exceeded. The problem with this is that these rules only apply if returns and price changes, you know, returns are normally distributed. And I've shown you here a nice, uh, very beautiful textbook illustration from Wikipedia that this is what happens with a normal distribution bell curve. But the problem, of course, is that returns in the market are anything but normally distributed. And I think this, this chart actually shows a very vivid example. This is roughly 10 years of daily returns for the Dow Jones, which you know, is not a wild index by most measures. And that's what the histogram is. The line is what the distribution would be if it were normally distributed. And of course, everybody knows about fat tails. You know, there's a lot of thinking about black swans. People, not just options traders, people think and talk about black swans. There have been some very, you know, even in the popular thoughts, some famous books written following the financial crisis. So we think about this a lot. One thing that I would encourage you to do, and most of you probably know this, but I think anytime something extreme happens in the market and you hear people drop stats like, this should only happen once in every, you know, several billion years, I, I would immediately dismiss that stat. And frankly, probably also dismiss uh, anybody who seriously gives stats like that, because these always are derived from a normal distribution, and they're absolutely, completely irrelevant because things are so not normal. One thing that I do want to point out, and th this might be one of those nuggets that gives you a little bit different way to think about it. I'll go back to the previous illustration. So we we're all aware of the weight in the tails. And you can see, if you, if you look at this, it, it's very difficult to see visually, but it's there. You can see a few events. There's one that's greater than you know, 0.1, 10%. And there are a few that seem to cluster. They look almost insignificant. But of course, statistically, these are extremely significant. That's what everybody thinks about when we talk about distributions in market. The other thing, though, is look at the middle. And for, for most traders, this is something we don't think about quite enough. The, the market has so many more events out at the extreme, but there's also much more clustered in the middle. And this, this is important. So what it means is that the market is both crazier. We have so many more things in the tails. And we also, it's also more boring. There are more days, many, many, many more days that just don't do anything relative to what we would expect and feel under a normal distribution. And by the way, that assumption of normality, you know, we make it for a good reason because so many things we experience do pretty much follow that. But just be aware the market is not one of those things. And be very, very careful. If you're using any systems, any tools, if you have any spreadsheets that rely on these assumptions of normality, it's not that you can't use these things. In fact, you know, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about how to adapt things that might not be 100% correct, how we can still use them. But just be aware that these assumptions, if you take them blindly, will destroy you. 
much of the edge as a directional trader. If you were not an options trader, if you were a swing trader, you would probably find that much of your edge, much of your profit comes from events that happen in the tails. In other words, extreme up and extreme downs. Um, if you're an options trader, the flip side of that's pretty much true. Much of the risk is in these tails, and they're so rare. You know, I personally know a number of options traders that made a lot of money for decades and literally wiped out their net worth in a single day. Uh, and w when you have these events that happen once every 10 or 20 years, it's very hard to understand them, to have intuition about them. So just be careful. Also, historical volatility. The whole point of that uh, little diversion is that horse, uh, historical volatility rests on this assumption of normality. So the, any price projections we make off of it are flawed. Another issue here, and I always seem to have a little bit of trouble with the, with the presentation tools, but uh, the moving window. So this is a 20-day historical volatility, which means if you can kind of calculate, I think you know, I'm moving the pointer back and forth over probably what's roughly a 20-day window. And what we see is that this way of measuring volatility creates some, <clears throat> some strange artifacts. Look, for instance, here. We have this very sharp decline around this period. Now, what I would ask you is, realistically, look where the look where the laser pointer is, is volatility a lot lower, like half. You know, we, we came from 12% and we went to 6%. These are whole number of percents, by the way. Is volatility half of what it was here? Well, of course not. You know, what, what has happened is we're moving this evaluation window, and this big event just happened to pass out of the left side of the window. So we experienced this big drop in the historical volatility. And, you know, it, it, again, it's not that the tool is worthless. Certainly, certainly not. You have, you know, in fact, here it responds correctly and immediately and appropriately to the big drop. But we do, we do have these kind of strange things that happen with the moving windows. And here's a comparison, just, just to completely highlight that, of five-day in red, 20-day in dark red or maroon, and then a half year, roughly 120-day in green. And, you know, you see some kind of strange things, like here's the big decline as this moves out of the five-day window, and then it comes later. These are subtle differences. Do they matter? It might matter. It might not. But I would say it's up to you to understand your system, to understand the tool, and then to address the question of does it matter or not. Uh, answer really is it depends. Here is perhaps a worse blind spot. So I probably should have made a chart with this, but I didn't. Uh, if you can imagine a stock that goes from 80 to $100 in two weeks, a very, very small daily range. So let's just say it goes in more or less a straight line. And now imagine another stock that has the same closing prices, but very, very wide daily ranges, or even you know, a lot of variation in daily ranges. Let's say it has some days that are 50 cents and then some days that are 10, 20 point ranges. So if you can kind of visualize those charts, I would ask you, is the volatility in each of those charts different? I would tend to say yes, right? You know, if you have a stock that goes from 80 to 81 in a day, but it might go down to 70 somewhere intraday, obviously something is happening there versus a stock that just very politely goes up. Uh, the problem with historical volatility, because it's calculated on the close, that it does not know the range. It doesn't know anything that happens about the range. And you can see here, I put a 20-day average true range against the historical volatility we've been looking at. And you'll see some important differences. You might be tempted to say it kind of looks the same. You know, volatility is declining here, and then it goes up here. Um, you're right. It does kind of look the same. And by the way, average true range has, still has the artifact. Volatility really did not drop here. It was just simply this passing out of the window. But there are more important differences. If you look here, we have volatility being flat while the range has actually declined. And here, certainly, volatility is going down, volatility is going up. So be careful about, d depending how you trade, how you manage your risk, how you understand risk, this might, this might matter or it might not. There are other academic measures. Uh, one's called the Parkinson's measure that does consider ranges. Um, and there, you know, there are many different ways. Historical volatility is not the only answer, I guess, is what I want you to take away from this and just be aware of the differences. Other issues, gaps. 
you know, gaps for, and I think the world is changing in some ways. We're seeing fewer gaps, um, but many mathematical measures have a lot of trouble handling gaps. And the ones that do handle gaps, I would even ask the practical trading question, in our understanding of gaps, have we adequately accounted for the risk? Does, in other words, does what, that, does what the mathematical measures see really reflect the trading reality? Trends also distort measures. And, you know, keep in mind that a lot of the academic finance, the, the, the idea is that markets don't trend. But I think our practical trading experience in almost every case is different, that there certainly are periods when markets trend. And many measures, many periods of, many measures of volatility are distorted by trends. Now, here's an important one. Volatility is not symmetrical or at least is not always symmetrical. This is, this is why I think the traditional finance approach of considering volatility equals risk is probably a little bit misplaced because I can certainly show you examples. I can show you examples in markets and I can show you examples in trading systems where volatility is predominantly to the upside or downside. And the question is, you know, should we account for those? And the answer, I think, in many cases is probably yes. Also, just be aware that if you start to look at other ways to calculate and measure volatility, that a lot of these measures over and underestimate consistently. So what do we do with all of this? Well, I think this is another important point, and this is maybe one of those nuggets some of you will take away. Any measurement is a model. And just a model is a simplification of reality. We can't deal with the complexities. Of, you know, there's no way anybody, of course, could deal with the full complexities of every single trade and every decision. If, if, you had, if you were omniscient, if you had all knowledge, you would know every trade. You would know the motivation behind every trade. You would know every pending trade. And that's a flow of information that even if you had access to, no human brain could, could manage that. So we always simplify. We must simplify. And there's, there's power in that. But you, when we simplify, of course, we lose detail. Realize that any model you use, and it can just be a chart. It can be you know, any number, any measure. These are only tools. And every tool will have a limitation. Every tool will be imperfect. Every tool will have some places that it works, some applications it works better than others. And the key in all of these cases, I think, is to really know your tools. Know, and, and this is why uh, you know, I think it's important to be a little bit of a numbers geek with some of this stuff, to, to, to really get into the details of the numbers, to understand how the measure is working and when it's not working. The, the more you know the more you know how to use them and the more you're aware of the limitations. So, you know, I, and I know I've just spent 10, 15 minutes talking about a lot of limitations with measures. It does not invalidate the utility. And the, the key, though, the skilled use of a model is knowing how to apply it. And that rests on truly understanding it. Let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about implied volatility. Again, most of you are probably very familiar with this, but you know, let me highlight a few things that I think is important, a few things that I think are important. So implied volatility is backed out of options pricing models. We're not really going to talk about that, but uh, you know, just be aware that this is the one, when we look at all of the things, you know, strike price, the underlying time to expiration, interest rate, uh, dividends, all these things that, get, that play into the options pricing model, Volatility is the one that we can't really measure. We just had a discussion about how to measure volatility, which way is right, which way would you plug into your model. We don't really know. So what we do to calculate implied, of course, is we look at the price the options market is giving, and then we work backwards and say, well, what volatility must people be using to, to give that volatility? Or to, to, I'm sorry, to get that price. What volatility would give that price? And again, you know, there are a lot of different models, and a lot of people kind of get caught up, a lot of particularly a lot of options traders with mathematical backgrounds, I think get kind of sidetracked. We get sidetracked with trying to find the perfect ultimate answer, but the best model, right? But the, the problem is that most of the people you're trading against are using some variation of a Black-Scholes model, and right or wrong, that is how the options market processes and sees volatility. So you know, I'll take you back to my previous point. 
I think that the trick here is to understand how the model works and the limitations and then figure out how you can use it and apply it. Let's talk about a couple characteristics of of implied. So this is the well-known volatility smile. Some people say volatility smirk. And the idea, of course, is that if we look at implied across a range of strikes, we see the markets giving different implied. And in stocks, out of the money puts tend to price higher implied. At the money, volatility tends to be lowest. So this may have some trading implications, right? Um, you know, you, you, of course, you need to think about the offset of some of the other Greeks, but um, it, it may make sense whether you're buying or selling volatility to be aware of the skew of volatility. I think that's important. Uh, this is a specifically, uh, that previous chart was very typical of what we see in stocks. Just be aware, one of the ways options traders stumble, if you build some success in one asset class and then go to another, you will find that many asset classes have more symmetrical curves or different shapes. They don't have the pronounced downward bias, which, you know, if you think, for instance, of a currency, that makes sense because which way is really down? Well, it, it depends on your perspective, right? Um, and one thing that I think is interesting, but we, we should not get too diverted here, um, if, if you like mysteries, Look at some of the explanations for this volatility, for this pronounced volatility smirk in stocks, uh, when it emerged, and you know how resilient it has been. There are a lot of explanations, and the ones that make sense to me generally sort of hang around liquidity and the way people use options. But none of these are fully sufficient. Uh, if you and last thought here, this is kind of a practical trading point. There, the the, the very simple. Bear put spread, bull call spread, you know, verticals, call it whatever you want. Uh, these typically benefit greatly from the the shape of this curve, and th this is one reason why these structures can be attractive to trade, though they can be a little bit difficult to manage. Another thing to think about, I think a lot of people think about the um, about the smile and some skew in some way, but it's also important to think about term structure because we see different expirations, price, different implies. I'm not talking so much about term structure and futures, volatility products. That's a little bit of a different animal and you know, something I think, frankly, most people probably trade a little bit too much. But uh, you know, we plot these together and we get a volatility surface that you know, it, it's interesting and it's something that I think most options traders, if you're not thinking about this in some way, you're probably missing uh, you're probably missing some place that you can pick up a little bit more of an edge. You know, I think a lot of people, um, actually, I'll flip over to the next slide. Actually, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I think a lot, lot of people, uh, you know, tend to think that there's an edge to just simply selling option premium because options are consistently overpriced. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, that that's a line of thought. I'm not sure it's a valid line of thought because the, my question would be, you know, are they fairly priced considering these very, very rare 10 to 20 year events, which I can't ignore. You know, so some people can say, you know, maybe I'll be out of the market by the time that it happens, but I'm, I, I'm not comfortable, you know, putting my trading program, basing my trading program on hope. And yeah, I need a, a little bit better measure. So I think if you're just thinking that there's always an edge to selling premium, you're probably headed in more or less the right direction. But if you work with a little bit of an awareness of skew and term structure, you can probably find a little bit more of an edge sometimes. Just, just another thought. Uh, looking at historical versus implied volatility. So now we've talked about both of these. And these will usually be different. I'm going to show you a chart of how they're different next. And why would they be different? Well, you know, I think we've beaten some of those reasons into the ground already. There are all these issues in measuring, in measuring volatility, both volatilities. You know, which, uh, which time period should I use for historical? And I'll show you an example of how different they can be in a minute. Um, those uh, artifacts from the windows implies, you know, how are you measuring your implies? Are we using some kind of average? Where are we looking on the surface? Are you using, you know, at the money? And also the issue of what are implies really pricing? You know, do, and I think the answer is, at least my understanding, is that implies price some expectation of future volatility with some premium for insurance built into it. 
And plus, you know, what th there's asymmetry. The lowest volatility could go, which is unthinkable, but volatility could go to zero, certainly can't go lower, but it could go to the moon, basically. You know, volatility could if, – if the VIX is at 16 today, then, you know, it really can't go lower than zero, and it certainly could go higher than 50. So there's – there may be some reasons – that we see these consistent mispricing. I would, however, encourage you to be careful. Some of the older options books, I think this is mostly eradicated, but there used to be a school of thought that said, you know, you'll just simply look for when these get out of whack. And here on your screen now, you see uh, historical in blue and a measure of implied. This is the VIX in orange. And then the gray background is the spread between the two. And, you know, it, it, it does tend to, the, this relationship does tend to have some bounds, but it certainly can exceed the bounds as it did in the recent election-driven volatility. Um, you probably can trade this relationship with a good awareness of longer-term history, but there's no easy trade here. So it, I think it is important also to be aware of the relationship of historical and implied. Here are some things that may be a little bit different. This is uh, some of the stuff you've probably seen in some capacity, some maybe not. To my way of thinking, so we talked about an academic approach to volatility, but there's another way. Volatility can also mean, to me, the switch between mean reversion and trending behavior. So I think a lot as a directional trader, as a primarily directional swing trader, I will look at a market and I'll do, I'll try to think about the emerging volatility conditions. And what I mean by that broadly is, are we, and we use a number of factors to make this, make this decision, but are we looking for an environment in which the market is likely to trend? So are big moves, are we in, in momentum mode basically, are big moves likely to lead to other big moves in the same direction, or are we going to be in snapback mode? Are we going to see big moves that lead to pretty quick reversals? Uh, that's not something that I think people think about enough. There are also cycles in volatility. There are cycles in that type of volatility. Uh, we see volatility in technical patterns. One of the easy things you can look at is to look at where the close is within the range of the bar, and there is a messy cycle there, but there is a cycle there. And why, you know, I think most of us find that volatility is a little bit more predictable than price, and there are cycles in volatility where it's unclear that there are cycles in price, and you know, there, 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 there are persistent cycles in price. And my understanding of why is I think it's very difficult. If you want to manipulate price and you have enough money, you can do it. If you want to manipulate volatility, it's a lot harder. You could theoretically you know, execute some kind of hedging where you tried to uh, lessen the oscillations. Conversely, you could just blast the market and you know, take out a lot of liquidity. But it, I think it is much more difficult for sustained impact on volatility, deliberate impact on volatility. And this may be one reason why it's a little bit more predictable than price. So with all of this, let's pause for just a second and think about what I think you really need to take away from this. Uh, all of this volatility stuff can get a little academic and a little obtuse. I think what you really need to understand is that we're just looking at models. You need to understand the models and how to use them. Um, some people get really sidetracked and scouring the surface for mispricing, though I think you should have an awareness of what's going on. You probably are not going to find more than once or twice in a career some extreme mispricing. Generally speaking, if you think you found a mispricing, you, there's a reason for it, and you're just not aware of it. Um, in general, you probably do also want to have some sense if you're selling cheap or expensive volatility. Uh, as for general behavior of volatility, this is another you know, kind of summary here. Uh, volatility has a long-term average level. If we look at any market over many, many years, we will see that there does seem to be some center line, some center point to the volatility. And when volatility gets far away from that level, it tends to go back. A conflicting factor is, and all of, all of this is now very important for the behavior of volatility, in the short term, volatility tends to stay where it is. So high volatility, we, we have these two conflicting factors. We do have the pull back toward the mean, but we also have a bias for volatility to stay high. Volatile shocks decay slowly, 
And this also means that volatile events cluster. When we have volatility that hits a market like, oh, I don't know, U.S. presidential election, the probability of more volatile events over the next few weeks is higher. The volatility of volatility, and I don't want to twist your brain too much with that, but you know, we also can measure how fast the volatility itself changes. So we're looking at the first derivative of volatility. And this tends to be persistent. So when volatility starts swinging around a lot, volatility itself continues to be volatile. There does seem to be seasonality in volatility. I could give a whole presentation on that. I'm not going to, but I'm going to show you an example. And if you, and you can do these calculations yourself. This is not hard to do. One thing you might think about is when we look at seasonality, it makes sense to tease out high vol and low vol years, which then asks the question, do we know at the time if we're in a high vol or low vol regime for a year? And the answer, in my practical experience, usually is yes. We, we have some pretty good idea of that. Um, and you know, last, as I said before, volatility tends to be a little bit more predictable than price. So how do we forecast volatility? Well, people tried a lot of things, and there's a lot of academic work. You, know, you can find thousands and thousands of academic papers and variations of academic models, and many of these things are tiny, tiny, tiny variations that, frankly, you know, I, I, I say this with all possible respect for this work, just don't have that much practical application to me as a trader. Maybe it's that I can't figure out the application, but uh, I don't see it. Um, and by way of understanding some of these academic models, let's talk a little bit about Garch. And by the way, if you need to get out of small talk at an upcoming holiday party, just drop this phrase, generalized autoaggressive conditional heteroscedastic models, and everyone will walk away from you. Uh, what these Garch models, so these are academic models or regression models that it, it sounds complicated, but it's actually very simple. The idea is that volatility depends on past volatility and that vol volatile shocks decay. You know, the, the, the comparison I always give is if we walk up to a quiet pond and we throw a big rock into it, we have a giant splash. And then what happens? We have ripples and those ripples fade away. That is how Garch models the decay of volatile shocks. And, you know, frankly, that's, that's valid. The problem is, of course, and where the, Gar the Garch models, in my experience, I think in most people's experience, don't tend to be that useful because the arrival of those volatile shocks is unpredictable. In other words, you're, you're, sit you're sitting by your quiet pond having a nice picnic, uh, enjoying the beautiful blue sky, and somebody mm -hmm. walks up and throws a, throws a boulder into the pond, and you never know when that's going to happen that those, those boulders will be dropped into the pond at random intervals and you'll be splashed. And the Garch model does not do much to predict that. As traders, those are the events we really care about. And it, you know, it, it is interesting to understand how the volatility decays. Garch gives us a pretty good understanding of that, but we still don't really know when these shocks are going to arrive. Let me give you another approach, another way to think about this. If we consider... And this is practical stuff, folks. So, you know, some of what I've talked about is, is a little bit academic, but this uh, will drive you toward models. I'm going to show you one that I have built that works very well. But based on this, I think you can do a lot of your own work, too. Uh, if we consider the two conflicting factors that I gave you, the idea of the return to the long-term average level balanced with the persistence of current volatility, we need to figure out how to balance those in some way. And some other things that we can add in, volatility of volatility. So, you know, that's persistent. The idea of seasonality. And then the one that I'm not, and this is one of the few things I'm not really going to go into too much detail, but technical factors. And there are technical factors that shape the evolution of volatility. This, to me, is a direct contradiction of a lot of the academic work that tells us that markets are very, very random, I can show you rather simple technical factors that have tremendous predictive power for volatility and for price, but more, even more for volatility. By combining these elements together, you can build a strong forecast model. And I want to show you this is not the, you know, the, the, this is not some secret work that nobody can replicate, but this is the out-of-sample fit for a model. So the model was developed uh, in 2005 on data up to 2005, and this is the data basically from 2005 to present. So if the model was perfect, all of the dots would lie on the orange line. 
the, how far we are away from the line is how wrong the model is. You know, it, it, so every one of these points is a prediction of average realized volatility one month forward. Uh, the horizontal axis is what the forecast was. The vertical axis is what it actually was. And you can see this model works quite well. Uh, it's certainly, you know, that there are cases, particularly at the extremes, where it overstates or understates, but for the vast majority of data, it is very accurate. And when it's wrong, it's not very wrong at all. And th th this, is, this is based on just a few, this is a forecasting model that's based on just a few of those factors from the previous screen. And you can do your own work. This, you know, this, this is not a secret. Uh, do you want a couple things here? So I think if you, I've built a number of models over the years and I've not really paid attention to utility. So you know, I go back through some of my work and I do think it's important that you boil it down to some very simple you know, almost bullet point, action point, if you will. You know, so I have 20 day historical volatility is currently 10.5. My model gives a forecast over the next month of 10.8. So we're roughly in line with the forecast. If you don't have that, you don't really know what to do with it. So I think it is important to boil down to that. By the way, also, th this is kind of an interesting chart because this puts different time periods. So this is a 20-day evaluation window for historical volatility, 60, you know, out to a yearly. This is, you can see how different the measure is as of the end of last week against the VIX also. And there are issues with the VIX we really didn't talk about. That's okay. But also look uh, at the range. Look, you know, so over the past year, we see a lot of variation depending on the valuation windows. So again, this just goes back to my point that you have to understand your model, you have to understand what you're measuring and the blind spots, and then you have some idea of how to use it. So if you have a forecast, what do you do with it? Well, uh, to me, it is helpful. And some people believe this is not predictable. I would argue it is predictable within very messy bounds, but you know, having th this is an edge. This is an edge you can give yourself that not everybody has. And if we can simply avoid selling lots of cheap vol, then that's, you know, that, that will put us on the right side of the game, knowing when there's an edge to buying or selling. And you know, one of the mistakes that I think a lot of people make is because it's human nature. We see a market makes a big move, and uh, we don't respect the, what's the word, the ferocity maybe, with which implieds are marked up. So we'll tend to see an event like the presidential election, and we'll rush to buy, you know, say, oh, the market's going up, I've got to buy a bunch of calls. But if you buy those calls, let's take, you know, I'll exaggerate. If you buy those calls when the VIX is 60, it's going to be very difficult to make money. And having a simple forecast model can just say, why don't you not do that? And of course, you know, some models, you can overwrite it when you choose, but the forecast model can let you know when these things apply and when they don't. Uh, so let's, if you have questions, go ahead and you know, get your questions ready, but let me wrap up here with a quick review. Uh, so we looked at what volatility is, we looked at how to measure it, and you know, all, some, not all of the things, but many of the things go wrong with the ways we measure it, historical, implied, artifacts, windows. Uh, one of the key points, I think, is really understanding how to use models to shape how you think about markets. Model does not have to even be right. Uh, you know, there are serious issues with Black-Scholes, for instance, but it's a very, very useful framework, and it's a, it's a very useful tool that helps us see the world. Uh, I do think if the, some of the points I gave about the typical behavior of volatility, if that was new to you, you know, we hear things like volatility is long-term mean reverting, uh, short-term trending. That's not that useful, and you know, it's, it's, that comes from one of the famous books that everybody's supposed to read. Uh, I, I think we can refine that a little bit more and have a little bit better understanding of how volatility really behaves, how we can forecast volatility, and just be aware if you're trading options, you know, you're not just selling something that's overpriced all the time. You are truly trading volatility, and certainly your big problems with trades will come from surprises that happen in the volatility. So the better you understand it, the better prepared and protected you are. 
So I think this is kind of all a beginning. You know, the next steps I would suggest that, and some of you have done these, of course, make sure you really do understand pricing models. Make sure we talked a lot about how uh, volatility evolves, but you need to understand a little bit more about the behavior of implied when things are really marked up. Uh, in particular, you need to understand how your Greeks will change in a trade. Uh, you know, for, as, as many of you know, there are issues. There may be very attractive vol that you want to share but very unpleasant implications in terms of gamma that you might need to consider. Uh, so you know, those, those are important for practical trading. Understand the hidden risks. And again, you know, I cannot stress enough, uh, if you're trading options and you have just swept all of these 10 to 20 year, one, you know, once, once in a decade, once every other decade risks under the rug. And if you're thinking, I'm not going to worry about that, I'm very concerned about you. I'm very concerned for you. And I, I would strongly encourage you to rethink that. And of course, you know, all of this has been very theoretical. Everything I've talked about today is almost academic, but what really matters and where, you know, the, the difficulty comes for many people is for most people is, uh, let me say almost everybody is in the application and your actions, what do you do in the discipline and you know, the psychological framework you need to support that. So I think these are kind of next steps. If you want to take what I've talked about today and go a little bit further, this will get you pointed in the right direction. Here are some resources that, you know, here's where you can find me. Uh, do follow me on Twitter at Adam H. Grimes. I blog a lot. Uh, here's a link to my blog. But if you follow me on Twitter, I try to tweet every blog I write. And I also have a mailing list on my blog. Uh, go to my blog in the right-hand corner, put in your email, and I'll drop some, you know, it, it, uh, my blog tends to be a little bit more theoretical. I try to drop a few more practical market things and market guidelines to people on my mailing list. And I do not, uh, you know, I won't mail you off at once, at most, once a week, but, you know, many times it's once a month. I also wrote a book that you can check out that is uh, primarily directional, of art and science and technical analysis, but I think it may give you a valuable new perspective on technical analysis. And then, you know, as Tom said at the beginning, uh, and again, thank you for your kind words. Uh, I do write research every day for my firm, Waverly Advisors, and you can check that out. Uh, we offer a free trial, and I'd love to have you take a look at it. Also, I want to point out one more resource. I have a free trading course, and this is really completely, truly free. There's nothing hidden. There's no you know, secret premium area that you can upgrade to. Uh, this is my effort to, um, you know, it, it's certainly been a good outreach and contact tool for me, but uh, really it is a gift, uh, and it's, it's my effort to give you a complete education in discretionary technical trading. So go check that out. You can find the link on my blog, but there's also the link up there. A lot of video, a lot of homework, and I will – Here's my contact information. So I'll just leave this up while we do some questions. Do we have some questions? Um, I did have one. I noticed you didn't really mention the uh, you have an option service uh, newsletter that's in addition to your regular newsletter. Uh, do you have any information on that? I do. And if you're and thank you for asking. If you're interested in seeing that, uh, just sign up for a trial, and we will you know we'll make sure to get that options piece in your hand too. Uh, we. we we, we communicate a little bit more than most firms. You know, one of the things that makes Waverly different is we don't sell a newsletter. We are a research firm, and this means we have clients, and this means we talk to our clients. So you know, it's a little bit of a novel concept, right? So, uh, you know, we certainly will just in our early communications – Tell us that you trade options, and we'll make sure that you see the options piece. What the options piece does, by the way, is um, and I think one reason a lot of people find value in it is that so much correctly, by the way, I'm not saying this is wrong, but so much of the thinking about options trading is non-directional. And this, however, is a directional approach to options trading. What we do is find powerful technical patterns with a significant edge and then build very, very simple option structures. Uh, you know, many times I'm just buying puts and calls. Sometimes we'll do verticals. Sometimes we'll do some ratio spreads, but really executing very simple trades around these directional tendencies. And we can do this because if you do have a true directional tilt, then every option you're looking at is mispriced which is a beautiful thing. And yes, so, you know, love to have you take a look at that and uh, just 
when you sign up for the trial, we'll make sure to get options piece to you also. Great. And uh, do you have anywhere that you're uh, updating those volatility models that people can look at? Uh, the volatility models are in the research also. So, you know, that's published because it's, it's relatively slow moving. We update it. Uh, and I also have, you know, I'll tell you another little personal thing. Uh, I've created some kind of interesting heat maps of global currency and equity volatility that maybe I'm unduly proud of, but I find them to be very interesting and useful presentations. And those are in the research. We update these about, you know, we publish a short daily research piece and a much deeper, uh, you know, much deeper and broader weekend report. And the volatility work is updated in the weekend. So you can see that in the research too. Uh, Andrew asked, what was the name of the book that you mentioned? Uh, my book, The Art and Science of Technical Analysis, you you can find it on Amazon, and a lot of it, you know, I last I checked, I think 200 pages were available to view on Amazon. So you you can look at it and get a you know get a pretty good sense of the flavor and if it would help you. And it's been, uh, you know, it, it is it is a different perspective on technical analysis in that it really is based on only tools that have a statistical background and tools that actually have an edge. And, you know, certainly it's gotten some great feedback from people. So check that out, the art and science of technical analysis. Adam, this is Jim. Um, a couple of points. Um, for those that weren't on, for our viewers that weren't on in the beginning, um, Tom and I had talked a little bit about how um, Adam's service uh, has been one of the most accurate, one of the things that we had ever seen. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, his call before the election, uh, and he doesn't make calls so much in direction, which he does, but, but much more so, I think, gives you a great, um, a great feeling for, for where the markets were. Uh, one of the things that, and I don't know if they were my, the words that I end up always using is melt up. I don't know if you used melt up or if you used other words, but you end up talking about how um, with all the technical analysis uh, that there was a possibility if we ended up going up that we could end up seeing a significant move higher, and that's exactly what ended up happening. Um, I ended up taking a look somewhat at the options in the S&P 500, and, and I ended up um, telling my my, uh, my subscribers uh, on the service that, that, you know, I saw the same thing, that I was, I was just a, hey, I don't know what's going to happen afterwards, but you do need to look at that. And I think that that type of information uh, that uh, I know you send out on a daily basis is just invaluable. A couple of points I just wanted to end up stressing that, that you covered. Uh, you end up saying how you were worried about people if they just sweep uh, um, things that may happen once a decade – under the rug. Um, when you're trading options, and especially if you're naked, if you're leveraged, if you're using a portfolio margin, that can be lethal. You know, I kind of take a look at it once every decade. You know, the guys at Long Term Capital Management, and they were one of the other ones when you end up seeing some of the analysis. You also mentioned this. This should only happen once every, you know, 10 billion years. That was the type of thing that took them out. And if three Nobel Prize winners, a dozen, you know, PhD quants uh, can end up getting taken out by, you know, their business destroyed, right? They're, they, they were blasted into, you know, kingdom come, uh, taken out completely. If an event can take them out, and by the way, the event that took them out was treasury, uh, um, it was correlation on treasuries from one treasury duration to another. If they can be taken out by that, we need to be really, really careful. Um, you know, when you talked about the volatility smile, could you go back to your volatility smile or smirk graph? Certainly, yeah. You know, one of the things that, that we had talked about um, uh, here on Capital Discussions and, and I brought up was that uh, – give me, if you give me the picture just for a second. That line on the volatility uh, smile on the calls on the left-hand side, right, this looks very much like a uh, – um, like the same type of um, index you'd see a little bit differently maybe, but, but pretty close to the way you'd see it on an equity index like the S&P 500. What we saw was that once you end up getting through the smile to the left-hand side of that, um, it's pretty much a, it goes into a straight line. One of the things that, that if you guys go back and watch some of the uh, uh, Monday Market Muse or the roundtable, a uh, pre-election uh, uh, hedging roundtable that, that uh, Tom and I and Paul Demers did, we ended up showing that there was a bump in that volatility, meaning that if I go about halfway up the left-hand curve, it was, it was a bump, meaning it was pulled higher. So the 
convexity of that curve ended up changing. A lot of our options traders who trade options in structures, you know, you buy this option, sell that option. Uh, this is the non-directional piece that you mentioned before, Adam. Uh, you know, we're basically making a bet that the volatility of this option is going to change more or less than the volatility of this other option. And a lot of people going into the election got hurt because of the change of that. Now, that was something that was normal. We ended up showing and we modeled or we at least showed graphs of what happened uh, to the exact same indexes as we were going into Brexit because it was a similar type of event risk, you know, understanding the risks going into events. Another thing that Adam talked about, okay, of how volatility ended up moving up going into the election and what ended up happening afterwards, you know, the event risk can be found a lot I I in this. Um, would you also go to the volatility surface picture that you ended up having? Certainly. Um, the, the volatility and being able to see direction or at least be able to get some type of hint okay, on which direction you need to protect against more. Um, I, I kind of take a look at it. To me, what's the perfect you know, match? The perfect match is if you can end up uh, having any type of slight edge on direction. Okay, which, you know, in the in the time that Tom and I have looked at Adam's um, Adam's um, news service or his letters that he sends out every day, uh, has been more accurate than anything else that we had seen. It gives us us uh, market neutral options traders a huge advantage. Now, as a market neutral you know trader, you know with the Kevlar that I do or the road trip trade that, that Tom does, you know we're always going to end up being market neutral. But it doesn't mean that in your your account you can't end up protecting something more or less. One of the things that ends up happening in, in this volatility surface map, and it's not shown very often, and uh, you know you talked a little bit about you know it's a starting point, it gets arcane, you know, but the devil's in the detail here. When most people talk about the VIX, and you've probably seen this a lot, Adam, people talk about the VIX, they're talking about a single number, a single yes. point. Yes, right, okay? right. What you're looking at here along the front, along the, if you will, the left to right or horizontal axis here, you're looking at strikes okay, going um, up and down. Or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, that, that you're looking at time. So basically the front of the graph is on the right-hand side. And what you're looking is basically price going up and down. Now, each one of those little squares is implied volatility. So the very first row all the way to the right is the implied volatility for each and every strike above and below the money. Okay, and you can see how the volatility. Okay, and that's what the surface is, right? So the three, the three um, axes, if we will, price or delta goes along that right-hand side, along the front going from um, lower right to um, um, to the left-hand side is how many days there are left in the trade, and then the size of the bars are the implied volatility for each strike at each expiration. Now, why is this so important? As options traders, especially market neutral options traders, what you're making a bet on is that one of those single boxes is going to move up or down more than another box or three or four boxes, depending if you're a condor or an iron condor trader or a butterfly trader. But that's the bet that you're making. And not understanding that is going into battle blind. You have to understand when other people talk about VIX, it's fine for them to end up taking a look at that single point. You need to understand that three-dimensional viewpoint. You know, the, the analogy that I draw, if you're looking at just the VIX, uh, depending on how old you are, but if you're old as Tom and I, if you're looking at a single point, it's almost like watching that 12-inch black and white tube TV with the rabbit ears you had in the bedroom when you were a kid versus looking at, and at this volatility surface map where you're looking at the 60-inch Ultra HD TV hanging on your wall that's about four and a half pounds, right? It is just a different game. And if you go into battle, okay, without understanding this, uh, you, know, you, you, know, you know the old expression, you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. You're not even bringing a knife. You know, you're going in you know, totally naked into a gunfight. You're going to get killed. 
You have to end up doing that. Having a little bit of an edge, understanding where volatility is in the direction, okay, that, that Adam ends up providing in the service. Um, I know that Tom and I, in our personal accounts, have ended up talking about that, and we've both um, profited handsomely by using options trades in and around uh, the information that, that Adam has done in his analysis. Tom, anything you want to end up adding to that? Because I know you and I speak a lot about uh, about um, some of the things that Adam comes out with. Um, no, I mean, uh, Adam, you've been uh, uncannily accurate over the, the almost year that I've been with you, and I, I thank, thank you. you for it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we do work with a lot is to try to give people the tools to do this themselves. You know, it's not – I think there's a little bit of experience, and one of the things that that makes my approach work is that you are getting a blend of some pretty deep quantitative tools with my 20-plus years of looking at the market every single day. But this the, 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 the really important point here – is that this is not some mysterious thing that will always be un unobtainable. People do develop these skills, and anybody trading over time, you know, I mean, we can help you get pointed in the right direction, but I think everybody can develop these skills for him or herself. So uh, I certainly appreciate your kind words on the research, and, you know, I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm delighted that it's been able to help you and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Any last things before we wrap it up, Adam? I don't see any questions. Uh, no, I don't think so. I am accessible for questions. So I know this will be recorded. People will see it after the fact. Uh, if you have a question, just shoot me an email. Uh, you, can, you can find my contact on my blog, or you can just adamhgrimes at gmail.com, or just send me a message to my blog, and I will do my best to answer the questions, and perhaps they will even end up as blog posts. So you know, I am accessible for questions if you have them. Well, Adam, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure, and uh, I'm sure we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everyone.